Hey everybody, it's Pastor Joel here and uh, just wanted to shoot a quick video today and share some thoughts with you. Uh, so we've been going through a couple of weeks of just really strange times. Um, there's, a, there's a scripture in Isaiah that a lot of people, I don't know if they know this is in the Bible. I feel like a lot of Christians do not know their Bible. They don't read their Bible, don't really study their Bible. And you know what? Right now is a great time to actually do that since, uh, well... We're home a lot. Uh, we got more time on our hands. Uh, many of us, if you if you're uh, furloughed or whatever, there's you know you have more time to to get into the into the Bible and and begin to discover for yourself what what God actually says. And so there's a scripture, and I, I actually wrote this in my journal. I'm looking at my notes here um, on my iPad back in uh, back in March 14th. It was actually the last Sunday that we were able to have service, and I, I just I had this feeling that this would be the last Sunday we'd be able to have service for a while. And um, I'm glad I heeded that, that prompting uh, from the Lord. But it says in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 20, actually, if you want to look it up, it's in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 20. There's this really wild verse in here that I believe is speaking to us right now. Now, what's interesting this day is my Bible reading schedule kind of follows this uh, I usually read at least two, sometimes the, the, the passage for a day will have three chapters from the Old Testament and a portion from the New Testament, sometimes a whole chapter, sometimes not quite a whole chapter from the New, and then a number of verses from the poetic books like Psalms, Job, Song of Songs, um, the Proverbs, and so forth. So each day there's a reading from these three sections of the Bible. And so I was reading my Old Testament section and I come across this verse and I, and I had this sense inside that, that we were heading toward um, everybody stay home kind of an order. And so here's this verse. It says in Isaiah 26 and verse 20, Come my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you hide for a little while until the indignation runs its course. And I'm like, that's what the CDC and everyone is basically telling everyone right now to do. And a lot of people are really struggling with this. People of faith, I think, are really struggling with this. So let's, let's just kind of process this a little bit. Let's talk it out. Because I see things getting posted. And, and this is these are legitimate things. Now, I'm not... Please get, don't get me wrong, I'm not being critical toward this because I think it's a legitimate point that's being made. I've seen it made by a number of people that I respect um, that, you know, we can, so we can go congregate at the store, but we can't have church. You know, what's, what's going on there? There's a few things going on there that might want to consider. Um, one one of the, the, the key things that I'm thinking about is when we come to church, we're typically all gathered together in the same proximity unchangingly for an extended period of time that I think allows uh, the potential for a contagion to be passed person to person more readily than if we are moving through an environment, doing our business and getting out of there, get back home. It's one of the most dangerous places to be right now, I think is Walmart. So that's, that's, there's, there's that consideration. The other thing I think that's, worthwhile to consider is that while we believe that God heals, we also know that, that God gives us wisdom and uh, that he says not to put him to the test. Jesus did not jump from the pinnacle of the temple, trusting in the scripture. It says he will give his angels charge over you and they'll bear you up in their wings and they're going to protect you and just go ahead and jump, Jesus. Go ahead and tempt fate and jump. And he doesn't do that. He I think gives us an example there where we need to not be reckless. And sometimes, sometimes faith um, requires us to do something that maybe doesn't quite look like the type of faith that we, we would have. But there's times when you read through the book of Acts, there's times when they hid themselves. And then there's times where they were bold and out in public regardless of, um, so I think that this is one of those times that we really need to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So this scripture came to my mind, okay? And I wrote it in my journal, come my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you, hide for a while till the indignation runs its course. And I really believe that this is the Spirit of God talking to us, that we need to heed this. 
that's why I'm coming down on the side of let's be quarantined. Let's follow this procedure. Um, I believe that this is an instruction that the Lord is saying, hey, I want you to do this. Now, there's something else to worth considering. There's a time in the book of Jeremiah, you also find it in 2 Kings, but it really comes out in the book of Jeremiah that there's a season where God says, I want you to obey. I'm going to put you under the authority of King Nebuchadnezzar, and I want you to obey him, and I want you to be subservient to him. And if you rebel against him, you're rebelling against me. And that's kind of one of those things where maybe God wants us to obey in this regard, and it's for our own benefit. And he wants us to obey somebody. Uh, some people, they've lived so recklessly and so rebelliously for so long, God says, I want you to obey somebody. You haven't obeyed me. You haven't obeyed the scripture. Maybe you'll learn obedience by obeying health officials who are urgently telling you to do this one thing. So sometimes God instructs us through the mouths of unbelievers and as Christians and people of faith, we need to be sensitive to this. This is where having a perspective of the whole Bible and not just a selection of a couple of verses that you saw on Christian television once upon a time can be beneficial. We need to take the whole scripture into account. Now, this might sound like a total contradiction, but I kid you not, these two verses came to me on the exact same day. I read this passage from the Old Testament. Come, my people, enter into your rooms. Hide yourself for a little while till the indignation is past. Isaiah 26, 20. And then, I, I'm not joking, totally serious. This is my notes from uh, March 14th, 2020. And I'm reading directly off my notepad here. Uh, on my tablet, it says in Luke 9, verses 1 and 2, watch what it says. It says, He called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over the demons to heal diseases, and He sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and perform healing. So I'm like, and, and then on that Sunday morning, I even I even mentioned this on that Sunday morning, I, in our time of worship, I read both of those passages. I'm like, I'm really not sure yet what to do with this. But as time is going on, this is becoming more clear. The leading of the Lord is, I believe, for us to adhere to this quarantine, and it's for a season. But there is a season coming. Now, please hear me. God is speaking to us right now. There's a season coming when we're going to go, and we are going to be used mightily of God to bring healing touches into people's lives. Now, with all of this in mind, I want to bring this kind of together by bringing you back over to the book of Joel chapter 2. And I know I've read a number of passages from Joel chapter 2 over the last week or so, uh, last two weeks really. But it talks about this time. Uh, the book of Joel even opens up in verse 1 with, has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? And it's like th you're living in unprecedented times, right? So skip down on to verse 12 of Joel chapter 2. It says, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me. So there's this message that God is wanting to tell to his people, return to me. God's talking to Christians saying, return to me. See, if you don't know the Lord, how do you return to him? He's talking about people that, have, that know the Lord, who have drifted away from him, who made everything else more important to them than him. He says, return to me. Return to me it, with, with, uh, in a genuine way. He says, with weeping and fasting and mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Don't let your, your repentance just be crying and outwardly, but let it be an inward change of the heart. Return to your God because he's gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, relenting of evil. Now, I've already read those passages. Let me, let's read a little bit further in the book of Joel. Look at what it says in verse 18. Actually, verse 17, back up one more verse. Verse 17 says, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, God's doing a work in ministers. I know he's doing a work in my life. I've been spending more time in prayer, um, in personal worship than in a, in a long season. This is, this is a time where I'm really taking it uh, serious to intentionally draw near into God in this season. Getting close to Jesus, I think, is imperative right now. It's the most important thing in my life right now, drawing near to him. He, so he instructs us, weep between the porch and the altar. He says, he says, I want you to take yourself and, and really posture yourself to, to earnestly seek me. 
and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord. Don't make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? There's a Time Magazine article talking about how, how Christianity has nothing to offer as a solution for the coronavirus. Why should the say among the peoples in Time Magazine, Lord, where is their God? This is why God is calling for his people who are called by his, his name to really earnestly seek him and weep and rend their hearts before him and get in his presence and say, God, speak to us, forgive us of our sin for ignoring you, for honoring you with our lips while our hearts were far from you. Help us to honor you with all of our heart. He says, do this thing. Now, verse 18, watch what it says. Note the word then. Say then. Then means if you do this, then. Look at the outcome. Then the Lord will be zealous. You know, Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, he tells the church, he says, be zealous and repent. He tells the church of Laodicea, he says, be zealous and repent. He's telling Christians, be zealous and repent, return. Be zealous about this. Don't be lukewarm about this. Don't be haphazard about this. Be zealous and repent. Now watch what happens. Then the Lord will be zealous. See, we've wanted the Lord to be zealous, but we just want to come into church lukewarm, get fed a little bit, feel a little bit better about ourselves, go home, don't tell anyone else about Jesus, don't really live for the Lord, just come and keep getting spoon-fed a little bit. And so God has had to put his people into time out he's got to put some church into time out so that the people of God will begin to earnestly seek him and not a church service and not a religious experience and if we will be zealous therefore and do that and really seek him then 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 after we do this then the Lord will be zealous for his land have pity on on his people he will answer and say to these people to his people i am going to send you grain new wine and oil you'll be satisfied in full i mark that word then in a distinct way and the reason i do that is because it allows me to it just pops off the page at me so skip on down to verse 25 then i will make up for you the years that the locusts the swarming locusts the creeping locusts stripping locusts gnawing locusts that great army which i sent among you there's a great army that's been sent among us. He says, then I will make up for you what's been lost. Then, look at verse 26, the middle part of verse 26. Then my people will never be put to shame. Now, why do I bring it into all of that? Because look at what follows into verse 28. It says, and it will come about after all of this that I will pour, this is God speaking, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. The mark of a true move of God is not a bunch of people falling on the floor. I look for a move of God that'll be like in the days of Ezekiel when the spirit came on the prophet Ezekiel. It says the spirit made him to stand up. Yeah, we haven't seen that yet. It's easy to fall down. It's another thing when the Spirit of God makes you stand up and sends you out with a new heart and puts a new spirit within you and you're a different person. Like he did to people. We see this in the Bible. He did this to people where the, the whole world looks and says, what has happened to the son of Kish? What has happened to this person that they are, they're living in this way? This is, this is totally out of character. God is at work here. Then... Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Then I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, we have wanted to watch God pour out his spirit on all mankind, but can I show you something about the order of how that works? In my prayer time today, this is what the Lord was showing me. When God pours out his spirit on the earth, he pours out his spirit on his disciples. Go back, go over to the book of Acts where we see this thing get fulfilled. In Acts chapter 2, familiar passage, it says this. Now, I've taken all over the Bible now. See how one thing in the Bible connects to another, connects to another? That's how God's message works. It's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together, and it's so exciting when you see how everything fits together. Look what it says in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly, there came, suddenly we're looking for a suddenly. We are looking for a heavenly suddenly. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a, like a violent rushing wind. Side note, compare what happens in Acts 2 with what the Bible 
talks about and what people tend to call the rapture. Look at the passages in the New Testament that deal with the second coming of Jesus to catch away his church. And you'll find that there are parallels between that and the initiation of the church and the catching away of the saints. This is what I'm looking for, though. I'm looking for a new Pentecost. Watch what happens here. Suddenly there come from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the house where they were sitting and there appeared to them clo cloven tongues as a fire, distributing themselves and resting upon them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What happens here? God pours out his spirit on the earth, but what does he pour his spirit into? He doesn't just pour his spirit onto dead, dry ground. He pours his spirit into open, receptive, clean, sanctified, cleaned containers. Containers who have repented, that have sought God. These, these are people that have been in prayer. They have been seeking God. God. He says, don't leave Jerusalem until you get filled with, you get clothed with power from on high, Jesus said in, in Luke 24, 49. So these are people that have been, well, we might just say it this way, they've been prayed up. Okay, They have been in the presence of God. They've been seeking him earnestly. God, move in my life. I want to know you. Cleanse me of any wicked thing inside of me. Don't make your, your, your people a reproach, a byword among the nations. Now watch what happens. As it goes on, they begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at the outcome of this. It says in verse 37 that when people on the outside heard this and they heard the message that Peter begins to proclaim. Peter says, hey, this is what was spoken of in the prophet Joel. This is what, what is what, what God promised. He would pour out his spirit on all flesh. And that's happening. God poured into his disciples. And when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what do we, what do, we do? But Peter said to them, repent. Let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because the promise is for you too. Here's the answer. When God pours out his spirit on the earth, he pours into his disciples. Believers become the fount of that outpouring. And what's the message to the world? Repent. Turn away from your sin. Ask God to cleanse you on the inside so that you can live for him on the outside. Now, let me wrap it up by kind of tying this whole thing together. Just start off with, come my people, hide yourself for a while till the indignation is past. You realize that Jesus' disciples, they spent some time alone with God. They were sequestered. They weren't having service like they, they weren't living life as normal. They were sequestered for a season. And when that season had come to an end, the Spirit of God came upon the disciples, those who were disciplined, those who stayed in that place and, and postured their hearts to receive from him, they received and they became the fountainhead from which God began to change the whole world. That's what I believe we can see. That's what I believe we might see. We might be on the very cusp, the very beginning of it. Will we actually posture ourselves in this time? There's a lot of ways that we can spend this time of sheltering in place, being at home. We can veg out on Netflix we could cry out to God and say, God, I'm, I want you to change me, make me more. I want to know you like I've never known you before. When this, is, when, when this season is past, I want to be a fountain of your blessing into the world around me. That's what, God doesn't want to just do a work in us that, that, that stops and ends here. He wants to do a work in us that flows out from us and changes others. That's, that's what he's been all about. He said, and you shall be a blessing was, was the promise he gave to Abraham. It, the, the promised blessing of Abraham wasn't just that he would be blessed, but that he would become a blessing. Wow. Are you hearing what God is saying? Are you hearing what God is saying to you? I believe that this is a prophetic message for us right now to take this time of quarantine and separation seriously as a spiritual exercise to posture our hearts and our families for the promise is not just for us growing, it is for our sons and our daughters. It's for our kids. 
is for old men, young men, God wants to pour into us, but let's posture our hearts so that we can do that. He said, I want you to spend a season repenting and, and allowing me to do a deep cleaning on the inside of you so I can pour into you so that God can bring the then and to bring the after this that could impact the world around us. Man, if God's speaking to your heart, I want you to pray this with me. Dear Jesus, I see you. I see what you're saying. I see your word. I hear your voice. Lord, may it be unto me according to your word. God, do it in my life. Do it in my life. Help me to posture my heart. Help me to steward my family. Help me to shepherd my family in this season so that their hearts are prepared to receive the pouring in so that we might be a fountainhead of your grace, that we might be a fountainhead of your spirit in the world around us when this season is over, that we might be a people commissioned of the Lord to go and heal the sick and to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would be a blessing and we'd be a people that not, don't just receive a blessing, but we would be a blessing in our world. May we be that people, God. May I be that person. May I be that leader in my family. May I be that son. May I be that daughter. Be it unto me, Lord Jesus, according to your word. Show me what you're doing on the inside of me. Help me to respond in a wholesome and good way to this word. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his goodness to shine on you. May he give you his provision, his protection, and most importantly of all in this season, his presence in your house, in your place of quarantine, wherever life finds you right now. May he be with you in Jesus' name. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.